streets hold many secrets. From alleyways in the heart of London to the quietest country lane, they've all witnessed cruelty and violence, jealousy and despair. They've seen crimes of passion and cold-hearted murder. They've seen killers escape and killers brought to justice. In this series, we'll be investigating the most notorious crimes and intriguing mysteries. Stories of men and women who killed, of the police who hunted them, and the victims who were left behind. From the files of Scotland Yard and far beyond, this is the dark history of our streets. on Y lies on the border between England and Wales. It is a small market town, the kind of place where everyone knows everyone, or thinks they do. In the years after the First World War, the town's top solicitor was a man named Herbert Ras Armstrong. The 52-year-old was a pillar of this small community. He was a clerk in the local magistrate's court, a church warden, a member of the Freemasons, and a man accused of being a double poisoner. Many in the town of Heon Wai could not believe the accusations against Armstrong. Others darkly suspected him of more crimes. In this episode, we shall hear both sides of the story, the case against Armstrong and the case for him. Was he a cold-hearted poisoner, or was he completely innocent? There was no doubt at all that his wife was poisoned with arsenic. And actually, when all the other evidence was put together, Armstrong was the common factor. I think there are very real doubts about his guilt. The vast majority of people in Hay were very much on Armstrong's side. Tellingly, the servants in his house insisted that he had not done it, that he could not have done it. And servants on the whole know exactly what's going on in a household. Herbert Ras Armstrong first came to Hay in 1906. He joined the firm of an elderly solicitor and was made partner within six months. He put down roots in the town. He brought his new wife Catherine there and the couple went on to have three children together. By 1913, the family were living in Mayfield, a handsome double-fronted home with extensive gardens. It's interesting, I think, to understand his own social background. He was from a lower middle class background, really, but a very clever man. He was educated at Cambridge and then at Liverpool. He got a law degree. He started practicing as a solicitor in Liverpool, then went to Devon and actually then bought uh, his way into a practice in the small town of hay on Wye. He comes with what are 
in social terms for Hay, considerable assets. He's accepted amongst the social elite, essentially, of Hay. And well respected, well regarded, genuinely liked. The Armstrongs prospered. Their lives seemed enviable, and they were, in every respect but one. Catherine was not a well woman. She had frequent illnesses, falls, and accidents. She self-medicated with a pharmacy of mail-order remedies. There were all sorts of conditions which Catherine Armstrong was subject to. She clearly had digestion problems. She would often be sick. She had what they called neuritis, which, and it was to do with um, muscles in her arm. She had lots of homeopathic remedies, and mentally she wasn't strong either. She certainly, on a number of occasions, dreamt that her husband had died and that dreadful things were going to happen. She seems to have been quite thoroughly and morbidly affected by that. In the summer of 1920, Catherine's physical and mental decline accelerated. She became more anxious. She had paranoid delusions, and there were even fears she might take her own life. So alarmed were her family and doctor that she was committed to an asylum. She stayed at Barnwood near Gloucester for five months. Her health improved. Early in 1921, Armstrong petitioned doctors for her to be released. There is no indication that he was doing this without the support of Mrs. Armstrong's own doctor in Hay, Dr. Hink. There is also no sign that her family is unhappy with the decision to release her. But the people running the sanatorium were actually quite concerned that she wasn't properly better. She returned to Mayfield, but her health quickly failed once again. Bouts of vomiting and restless sleep weakened her. She complained of sharp pains inside. As her condition worsened, a full-time nurse was employed to care for her. She continued to decline, however, and was soon bedridden. Catherine died on Tuesday, the 22nd of February, 1921. She was 48 years old. The cause of death was recorded as gastritis. An announcement was made in the local paper. Her burial was a small family affair. And that might have been the end of the story. Were it not for an extraordinary accusation made almost nine months later. Armstrong was not the only solicitor in Hay. Across the road from his own office was another solicitor's firm, Griffiths and Martin. And like Armstrong before him, Oswald Martin was a newcomer to Hay. And like Armstrong, he had ambitions. In late October 1921, Armstrong invited his fellow solicitor to tea. But after leaving Mayfield that Wednesday evening, Martin fell violently ill. Herbert Armstrong talked to him, said how much he was missing his wife, who had been dead for a few weeks then, served him tea and a buttered scone, handed a specific scone to him and said, excuse me, girls, and other than he Julie at the scone, and then he became violently ill. 
does not seem to have suffered from it for longer than 24 hours. Given his supper that evening could well have been either indigestion or some degree of gastric flu, food poisoning, whatever. His supper was jugged hair, followed by creme caramel, which is not exactly a light supper. His father-in-law, Fred Davies, was concerned by Martin's sudden illness. Davies was, in fact, the local chemist, and he remembered Armstrong buying arsenic in his shop. And he remembered his suspicions about Catherine's sudden death. He took his concerns to the local doctor, and they agreed a sample of Martin's urine should be tested for arsenic. On Monday, the 31st of October, Davies and the doctor parceled up the sample and posted it to the Clinical Research Association in London. And so began a chain of events that would upend the peace of their tiny market town and plunge Herbert Rouse Armstrong into a fight for his life. The package which was sent to London containing Oswald Martin's urine sample also included a box of chocolates. It too was to be tested for arsenic. The chocolates had arrived at Oswald Martin's home more than a month before he took tea with Armstrong at Mayfield. They came with no note, no card, no clue as to who had sent them or why. Nobody ever traced how it arrived. Nobody ever traced who purchased it. They weren't chocolates that were locally available in hay. Oswald Martin and his wife, who he'd just married, they didn't particularly like chocolates themselves, but they were entertaining, and one of their guests ended up being violently ill afterwards. The chocolates and Oswald Martin's urine sample were tested. Both contained arsenic. A police investigation was launched at once, and on the 10th of December 1921, Chief Inspector Alfred Crutchett of Scotland Yard was dispatched to Hay. He interviewed Oswald Martin, his wife, and his father-in-law. He heard how Armstrong had continually pestered Martin to come to tea, how he had passed him by hand a ready buttered scone saying, excuse fingers. How Martin then spent the night being violently sick and how since his recovery, Armstrong had invited him over again and again. The behavior certainly seemed suspicious and the inquiry soon widened. Police began to take an interest in the death of Catherine Armstrong. There had long been gossip about the couple in the town. She was very rigid in her views. She wouldn't allow any smoking in the house or any wine. He was regarded a little bit as uh, being a bit henpecked, I think. I think most of that is retrospective because what is very plain is that he enjoyed being run by Kitty. He enjoyed having standards kept up and being reminded of those standards. When a man like Herbert Armstrong turns out as well-dressed as he does, that tells you a very great deal about the household he comes from and about who runs the household. And that was Catherine. Was the talk of the town to be believed? Had Armstrong tired of his wife and done away with her? Crutchett decided to bring the solicitor in. On the morning of New Year's Eve 1921, he waited with two other detectives opposite Armstrong's office in Hay. As Armstrong walked the mile from his home in the biting cold, he would have had no idea of what was coming. In the months since his wife had died, Armstrong had been busy. 
Within weeks, he had applied for passport and gone for a holiday. He visited France, Italy, and Malta, where his diary suggested a packed schedule. La Traviata with Miss B. 10 a.m. Miss Buchanan. 11 a.m. Miss McRae. The life of a widower seemed to be suiting him. When Catherine Armstrong died, the servants at the home drew the curtains as a mark of respect. Well, Herbert Armstrong opened them up again and he, he didn't seem to be grieving uh, about the death of his wife. He was, in effect, released from all the inhibitions that her presence had caused in earlier stages of his life. Armstrong returned home refreshed. He was soon strutting around the town, dapper as ever, drinking and smoking however and whenever he liked. There was just one irritant in his new life, Oswald Martin. The two solicitors were engaged in a complicated legal tussle. It hinged on the sale of an estate at nearby Brecon. Armstrong was representing the vendor and Martin the buyers. But the sale had not proceeded as planned. Each side was blaming the other. The legal wrangle that they got into in 1921 is very strange. Armstrong seems to have indicated that he had managed to sort out confused land titles. Now, if you've got confusion of titles over boundaries, access to land, various things like that, you have a very real problem. And it seems that that was what complicated the whole sale and that that was what, on the Vela Newitz side, was complicating things. Martin subsequently suggested that Armstrong had been dragging his feet. This transaction seemed to be dragging on. The buyer had paid a deposit, uh, 500 pounds or so, which, of course, was lodged with Herbert Armstrong as a solicitor for safekeeping. And then the man changed his mind, decided that he wasn't going to buy the estate after all, and wanted his money back. It's sort of implied, really, that Herbert Armstrong didn't have the money anymore and had probably spent what was the actually the client's money on himself. The sale would be a lucrative one for Armstrong, but its failure could spell professional and financial ruin. If only the meddling Martin would get out of the way, he must have thought. It was around this time that Armstrong first invited his rival over for tea. Within weeks, the police would be in hay and Armstrong would be under suspicion. On the morning of the 31st of December, he left his home to go to work and he would never return. Almost as soon as he reached his office, the policeman appeared at the door. He was searched, and among the letters found in his coat pockets was a twist of paper, and inside that was a fatal dose of white arsenic. Armstrong was immediately escorted to a cell in Hay Police Station. The news of his arrest electrified the town, as did the grim rumors that followed. The body of his wife, Catherine, was to be exhumed. Bernard Spilsbury did the post-mortem, and they found that there was an enormous amount of arsenic in her body. And really, the pathologists um, medical explanation of what he'd found made it clear that arsenic was the cause of death. 
He was absolutely adamant that despite the decomposition of the body over 10 months, he could discern evidence that a very substantial and fatal quantity of arsenic had to have been administered to Mrs. Armstrong within 24 hours of her death. And Spilsbury was considered at that time such an expert that virtually nobody would have dreamt of rejecting, refuting that kind of medical evidence. The doctors believed Catherine had received a massive dose of arsenic in the last 24 hours of her life. She was bedbound at the time, too weak to even lift a glass to her lips. She could not have taken the poison herself. The police knew there was arsenic in Armstrong's house. He had admitted he'd bought it, claiming it was for weeds in the garden. Police also knew the solicitor stood to benefit from his wife's death, thanks to a new will signed the previous year. Armstrong had the motive, means, and opportunity. Surely he was the killer, wasn't he? Everyone who knew the couple well spoke of it. Herbert Ross Armstrong loved his wife. For despite their mismatched looks, Armstrong and Catherine complimented each other. Both were religious and shared a love of music. They liked to argue, to debate. And perhaps that's where the cruel gossip came from. A woman in those days was expected to defer to her husband after all. Her forthright intelligence was unseemly. They seem to have been genuinely fond of each other. And even more, they seem to have had social ambition in common. We know that if you turned up to one of her at homes or tennis parties or the other entertainments that they had improperly dressed, she was deeply offended and quite likely to remove the offender from her social circle. When Catherine died, some thought Armstrong too cool, too detached. But grief is expressed in many ways, and men in those days were not expected to show emotion. Armstrong was a solicitor and a former army man. His was the stiffest of stiff upper lips. But those who knew him best could see the impact of his wife's death. His departure for the continent a month later was pressed on him by friends and his doctor concerned about the strain he was under. His holiday was not the jaunt of a merry widower. Witnesses spoke of a sad looking man who spent his time alone or with male friends, exactly what you might expect of the recently bereaved. Even those diary entries had innocent explanations. Miss B was a dance instructor, Miss McRae her assistant. So if the evidence did not suggest Armstrong hated his wife and longed to be free of her, what of the other proposed motive? What of the money? During the First World War, when Herbert Armstrong was away, Catherine Armstrong, who had a certain amount of money on, in her own right, made a will that left everything to her three children and then £50 a year to her husband. The will that she made in 1917 was a will that reflected the realities of where she was in 1917. At that stage, her husband was on active service. He had the prospect of going to France. She herself contemplated suicide on a number of occasions. You can understand her anxiety about getting things organized and properly sorted out. But in the immediate period before Catherine died, she had a new will 
made in her name. That reversed the will and left um, everything to her husband. By this time, Herbert was home safe, though her health was still dodgy, so a will needed to be made and remade fairly urgently. If getting his wife's money had been the motive for murder, then what Armstrong did next is strange. He did nothing. None was transferred to his own accounts. None was spent. He did not touch it because he did not need it. Police could find no evidence that he was in financial distress. His accounts were all in credit and his business was growing. Why then would he kill his wife? Armstrong never denied owning arsenic. He purchased it legally from Fred Davis, the chemist in Hay. He signed the poison book as required by law. And the use he put it to was not unusual either. Gardeners all over the country used arsenic as a weed killer. I find the fact that he had arsenic around something which is unsurprising. And where was he going to get it? He was going to get it from the local pharmacy because he had no sinister purpose. They found arsenic in his office. In his pockets, they found arsenic in little packets. So why would a respected uh, solicitor have arsenic in his office in the town centre? Why would he have little packets of arsenic in his pockets? What was seen as being telling negative evidence against him was that he could not account for all the packets of arsenic that he had bought. Interestingly enough, I think that you can say that he was more careless about it because Kitty wasn't around there to oversee and regulate things. On the day Armstrong was arrested, he was wearing his gardening jacket. The arsenic police found in his pocket was just a leftover dose. There was nothing sinister about it at all. Armstrong was master of the house, of course. He could come and go as he pleased. But he was also a busy man. Most of the time, he was at work. And when he was at Mayfield, there were the three children, two servants, and at the end of Catherine's life, a full-time nurse as well. A packed house for a poisoner to work in. There's no evidence for how Armstrong might have poisoned his wife, or precisely when. He had actually moved out of the marital bedroom into a small bedroom across the hall because there was round-the-clock care. In the last weeks of Kitty's life, she was carefully looked after by women folk. The women folk employed to run the house and employed to nurse her. Doesn't really have a chance. Nobody saw Herbert Armstrong giving her anything that was poisoned, but that amount of arsenic got into her body somehow or other. So what might this defense of Armstrong say really happened? Of the chocolates received by Oswald Martin, there was no evidence to link them to Armstrong. Martin's illness had just as much in common with gastric flu as it did with poisoning. And the arsenic found in his urine could have been an impurity introduced by the unscientific sampling method. Catherine, however, certainly died of arsenic poisoning. The question is, at whose hand? The medical experts who examined her body insisted the arsenic must have been taken within 24 hours of death. But there have been cases where someone has taken a large, fatal dose of arsenic and lived for several days. 
And it's like a, a many things that a small amount of something that's otherwise poisonous can be used in medicines, can be used for health reasons. So it all depends on the dose. We now know later on that Spilsbury's conclusions were, to put it mildly, unfounded and dangerous, that he could not possibly have made a valid assessment as to when arsenic was administered to her. The medical and scientific um, criteria weren't really so well established to judge the effects of that on any particular individual. So a large amount would kill people almost straight away, but if it was small amounts delivered over a certain length of time, the situation isn't so clear. It was only in the last few days that Catherine was confined to her bed. Could Catherine have taken the arsenic herself before then? She was unwell. Doctors at the asylum had come to believe her physical symptoms were psychosomatic. It was her mind they were really worried about. She was suffering delusions, paranoia. On more than one occasion, she discussed killing herself. She could have found Armstrong's store of arsenic and taken it deliberately. Or she might have mistaken the powder for medicine, like the homeopathic remedies she swore by. There are possible alternatives for how the amount of arsenic actually ended up in her body, including um, from the various medicines that she herself had taken, to say nothing of medicines prescribed for her. We know, for instance, that she was taking bismuth, and preparations of bismuth at that time used arsenic. These were the possibilities being considered as Armstrong's defense was gathered early in 1922. Pleading his case in court would be Sir Henry Curtis Bennett, one of the most famous and brilliant advocates in Britain at the time. The trial was scheduled for the 3rd of April, 1922. Was Armstrong an unrepentant poisoner or a grieving husband falsely accused. It'll be up to the jury to decide. When Herbert Ross Armstrong first appeared at the magistrate's court in Hay, onlookers had cheered him. The accusations made against him were serious, murdering his wife, poisoning a rival, but many in the town were on his side. Armstrong's trial would not take place in Hay, though. His fate would be decided at the Hereford Assizes in the April of 1922, and a far more hostile welcome was waiting for him there. The judge was Lord Justice Darling. He was age 72 or 73, very senior judge, uh, very experienced. Mr Justice Darling had acquired the reputation of being a hanging judge, of coming down stern and hard on the accused, unless there was absolutely unequivocal evidence to suggest the need for acquittal. His hostility to Armstrong would be obvious throughout the case. He acted almost as another prosecutor with frequent interventions to undermine the defense and bolster the case against the accused. But it was the scientific evidence that would decide the case. The defense experts included Dr. F.S. Tugud, the medical superintendent of Lewisham Hospital. They were eminent and respected, but no match for the prosecution. 
The experts they called were the foremost in the land. Toxicologist Sir William Wilcox and star forensic pathologist Dr. Bernard Spilsbury. The men stuck rigidly to their analysis. Catherine had been poisoned with arsenic before she entered the Barnwood Asylum. When she was released back into Armstrong's care, the poisoning began again. The fatal dose was taken on the last day of Catherine's life. It was impossible for her to have taken it herself. Henry Curtis Bennett, he is blamed by those who think that Armstrong received a poor trial for being incompetent or lackadaisical in his defense. But I think that is actually unfair. He did what he could. His key strategy was to get Mr. Justice Darling to dismiss the evidence relating to a supposed attempted arsenic attack on Oswald Martin. So they uh, wouldn't have been able to have proved that it was Armstrong who sent the chocolates, but all of that surrounding evidence sort of painted a picture that was very damning about Herbert Armstrong's involvement. The basis for his defence had been to get the Martin evidence thrown out. The problem was that you had pretty much a vicious circle. What was the proof that Armstrong had murdered Kitty Armstrong, that he'd tried to poison somebody else? What was the evidence that Martin had been the subject of an arsenic attack? The fact that he'd murdered his wife with arsenic. Bennett can only try to put forward in Armstrong's own words some kind of corrective to shake the jury. He doesn't have any real alternative. On the seventh day of the trial, Armstrong himself entered the witness box. For seven and a half hours, he answered questions from his defense barrister, from the prosecution, and from the judge. He denied it all. He did not pass Martin a buttered scone. He did not say excuse fingers. And he stuck to his explanation of the arsenic found in his coat pocket. Because he was familiar with courtroom proceedings, he gave evidence in a very strong and credible way to a certain extent. But in fact, the judge asked an enormous numbers of detailed questions, particularly on why he had so many little packets of arsenic in his pocket. Armstrong, for instance, said that the scones were not buttered. And I find that more convincing. According to Martin, the scone was handed to him with the phrase, excuse fingers. And I'm sorry, but that's not the kind of phrase somebody who'd been trained by Kitty would have used, nor is it something that Kitty would have permitted at any such tea table. It's the kind of thing that is terribly non-you. A lot of it was pursued by the judge himself rather than the prosecuting counsel. So perhaps the defence counsel could perhaps have objected and the judge being so involved, but in practice that was unlikely to be successful. By the end, he'd faced over 2,000 questions and impressed the public gallery with his calm under pressure. When he took his seat again in the dock, he knew he could do no more. He relied on the rest of his defense team and the summing up of his lead counsel, Mr. Curtis Bennett. The final speeches were delivered on Wednesday, the 12th of April. The Attorney General reiterated the case for the prosecution, as did the judge. The jury withdrew to consider their verdict. 
Curtis Bennett remained confident. The veteran of almost 50 murder trials, he expected an acquittal and took himself off for a walk. He was still walking when the jury signaled that they'd come to a decision. Armstrong was guilty. It has to be remembered that the timing of the trial was in itself unusual. The size session was virtually over when Armstrong was charged and remitted for trial. You have a special extension for Armstrong's trial, and that, as much as anything else, tells you they wanted to get it through and sorted. No doubt the people of Hayon Wai divided into different camps on who they believed and why. Of course, it caused enormous amount of gossip and intrigue and concern in Hayon Wai. I think the verdict was not a surprise to anybody in particular who had heard Darling's summary. His direction to the jury was pretty well, unless you're trying to say that this very fragile, ill woman took arsenic herself to kill herself, you have to find Armstrong guilty. It was a highly biased, deeply damaging summary of the realities of the trial. So that essentially sealed Armstrong's fate and his long-standing reputation as a man guilty in law and the notorious hay poisoner. An appeal was lodged, but once again, Armstrong's side of the story was not believed. The solicitor would hang. The 31st of May, 1922, was a morning like no other in Heian Wai. Those out early that morning might have been walking along Broad Street, past the closed door of Herbert Armstrong's office. They might have snatched a glance across the road at the premises of Oswald Martin. Or perhaps they were outside the chemists where Armstrong purchased his poison and where his journey to the gallows began. Wherever they were, they would have listened for the bells of the hay clock. As it struck eight, they would have known. Whichever side of the story they believed, whether he was innocent or guilty, one thing was now certain. Herbert Armstrong was dead.